There we go. All right, we are back on this supersized preview show. This is episode two. We're going to talk defense and special teams. Joining us once again, we have the crew from the Scarlet Faithful, David Anderson and Aaron Brightman, and we have Larry Cranin from the Night Watch, uh, and of course, Richie and I from the Night Report podcast. Before we get into the defensive and special teams preview, uh, this podcast is part, brought to you in part by Night and Day Apparel. Get ready for football and tailgating season with Night and Day Apparel. Our apparel is designed to keep you comfortable and stylish from the pregame excitement to the final whistle. Whether you're grilling in the parking lot or chewing from the stands, our high-quality gear has you covered with unbeatable comfort and team spirit. If you use our promo code Rutgers Rivals, you get 10% off your purchase. Score big this season and keep chopping with night and day apparel. All right, let's talk about this defense, which uh, first off, let's just talk about the loss of Mohamed Ture and how big of an impact that will make on this team. David, I've kind of wanted to hear your take on this loss since it happened. So how big of a loss is that for Rutgers? And we'll kind of do the same thing where we go around and talk about it. Sure. I mean, I think he's your most impactful defensive player. I, I don't know if it would be fair to say he's your best over, you know, an Aaron Lewis or Robert Longerbeam, maybe even Flip Dixon. But I mean, what Toure was able to do is just without skipping a beat, Powell goes, is ejected in the first in against Michigan state. And then is eventually injured steps into that linebacker core but then late in the season when they had some other options, he, he shifts in. And in that Miami game, one of the big plays was he lined up against an offensive guard, manhandled him, got a sack, and we don't even know what the play would have would have, would have been the play because of that's how quick it was like that. And so I think the it's not necessarily a loss from a pure linebacker, a pure pass rusher, but his versatility and the way that opposing offensive coordinators have to prepare for the Rutgers defense is – probably a little bit easier the big question is how do they replace it do does somebody else step into that versatile role or are we just dealing with every level has to kind of take care of their own business yeah i think uh i really can't say it much better than david said it uh, i agree with everything he said uh and i think it just makes the Rutgers defense unfortunately a little bit less dynamic uh and a little bit more unproven now in terms of what you have behind him uh, and I also think just in terms of, you know, Shiano even said it on Monday in his press conference, he basically said, you know, he, he could be their best defensive player, best player on the team. So if Shiano is saying that in the press conference, I think also there's never a good time to have injuries, but the emotional impact, at least they have had a little bit of time here in the preseason to absorb it and be able to prepare. Uh, and obviously the replacements and how they're able to game plan, knowing that Ture is no longer part of the overall plan, but I think it's a huge loss. If if you were to say before the season, who's the one guy you don't want to lose, uh, at least on defense, I would absolutely say Teray. So it's a huge loss. Huge loss. And at the end of the day, you know, it's it's tough for the team to absorb emotionally sometimes when a leader like that goes down. That being said, it kind of feeds into the chop the moment mentality, you know, the family mentality. It didn't happen, you know, the, the first – game of the season or, or the first drive against Virginia Tech or something where it could really demoralize you, completely blindside you. This this happened with a, a week or, or a week and a half to prepare. No good time for this type of injury to happen. Richie said on the on the cast when he went down, they know there's a lot of depth at that position. I'm inclined to agree with that for obvious reasons. I think a guy like <laughs> this, though, when – when David, you know, uh, says what he says, which is that, you know, maybe not from a pure linebacker standpoint, um, do we revert back to more of a base type uh, design and, and guys have to step up from their respective positions? Players like that, though, who are just game changing players, I mean, electric players who are versatile, who line up in a different position and come up with a sack, who are flying all over the field, those guys change games. And they change momentum in close games. And so you can't really understate the loss of a guy like that. There's no way around it. Does that derail Rutgers' season? Hopefully not. Probably not. But is it a serious loss and kind of a, ugh, before the season even starts? You bet it is. Yeah, I mean, it, it hurts to lose him, like everyone else has said. Like, he's just so versatile. It's the word that you always hear when you – it goes hand-in-hand hand with Mohamed Dure. Um, he can play – edge rusher he can play linebacker like uh, Dave said before he's lining up against offensive guards at some points um, he can kind of do a little bit of everything now how you replace him it's not going to be easy I don't think there is a replacement necessarily for him just because of that versatility 
but they do have some good young up and coming linebackers between Moses Walker, between Jabome, between Abram Wright. Uh, Timmy Hinspeter has been playing a couple snaps last year as a, a preferred walk on. So I, I do think there's a lot of depth at that room. I don't think they'll be able to replace him, but I think they'll be able to find someone that can at least kind of fill the void enough that it's not going to affect your whole defense. Yeah, I'm not going to say anything that hasn't already been said. Versatility is key. The fact that he was able to move from an, an undersized edge rusher to an off ball linebacker in one off season and not only not skip a beat, but almost like improve his play as an off ball linebacker. Uh, to a position he really hasn't played maybe since Pop Warner is really impressive. Um, the the amount of experience he's had in multiple defenses, just the kind of the football IQ he has, getting guys in the right positions. Obviously, he doesn't play the the, the mic that's Tyreen Powell getting guys set, but he's just a very experienced player. There's no way to replace him with with one guy, like everyone said. He's led the team in sacks three times in his career. I think the, if you're going to look at a silver lining here. If you look at all the guys that this defense is going to lose going into next season, getting a guy like Mo Ture back for the 25 season could be a huge stabilizing factor to that entire team, especially on defense that's going to have almost entirely junior, sophomore, and freshman lining up at key positions. So sort of like the Brantley thing where he didn't get to play last year, but it might be a blessing in disguise, like Shiano said. Not saying that we couldn't use Ture this year, but I think he would have a bigger impact on next year's team than this year's team. And Mike, um, just before we move on, just to piggyback on what you just said, you know, you made a comment that he he went from maybe an undersized edge rusher to uh, an off the ball linebacker, and he and he made such an impact. I think that speaks to the staff though, and how they're able to develop these guys. And he stepped up and became that player, you know, last season. And now you may have another guy who steps up and becomes that type of complete player because this staff is a the pipeline. They're always talking about it. They're getting somebody else ready. Maybe this gives them a chance to shine and develop. And then he comes back next year to your point. So just another point that you kind of sparked in my head there. Yeah, totally. And it seems like you hear a lot of rumblings about specific young players splashing and making highlight plays and really impressing the staff. And I've heard at least half a dozen guys on defense the last couple of years that we haven't even seen really play this year that the staff is like secretly really excited to see how they play on the field. Um, let's talk about position groups next. Aaron, I'm going to go to you. What position group concerns you most depth wise and what position group are you most comfortable with if a guy went down and had to be filled in by his backup? Well, I think you have to say linebacker in terms of concerns. Uh, I know people are really high in the depth in terms of Dejambi uh, and uh, Moses Walker. I'm really high on Walker myself. Uh, but at the same time, you know, we don't know how long Powell is going to be out. And I think where, where you're going to have the impact there is the situational experience that uh, Powell and Ture have. Uh, that's not going to be on the field uh, for however long Powell is out. So I think that's where... You know, the, the longer, the further in you get into the season in Big Ten play, obviously at Virginia Tech, uh, those guys are going to be seeing things for the first time live and have to react. Uh, also, just in terms of the communication. The other thing with Ture is, you know, he is one of the captains, uh, multi-year captains. So you have one less leader on the field for the defense. So I think that's a huge concern. It's not to say that Dejambe and Walker can't be uh, very good linebackers for this team. But I think there's going to be an adjustment period for this defense uh, in terms of as they get into the more difficult part of the schedule, uh, they're going to be missing those guys. And, and hopefully Powell is back sooner rather than later. But I think that that's where the bigger concern is, not necessarily athletic talent or ability, but that experience and, and the knowledge that those guys bring to the table in terms of leading the defense. And then overall, I'm really high on the, second, on the safety group. I think uh, Ibnusin, Loyal, uh, and Dixon, obviously, all back. Uh, you'd hate to lose any of those guys, but with those three there, uh, and I think some of the younger guys behind them, uh, having two of them to help whoever that is along, whether it's a Bo Moscow uh, or, or um, any uh, or Kaj, uh, Kaj Sanders. Sanders. Potentially. Um, you know, th th I think that having two of those three back, I mean, those guys have so many snaps, uh, so many experience under their belt. Uh, they've all shown big playability, whether it's interceptions or even on, you know, uh, uh, blitz calls uh, that Harris Simiak makes in terms of getting a sack. So I'm really comfortable with the, sec uh, the safety group. I think they're a strength. And, uh, you know, you'd hate to see any of them to go down, but I'd feel most confident with that group. 
Obviously, I, I think when you have the linebacker concerns because of the depth, because of some of the injuries, and you saw it last year when Powell goes down against Ohio State, we can't seal the edge on a run when it's still kind of a dogfight. And right there, you have like explicit proof of what you can lose when you lose athleticism or depth at that linebacker position. But I think you know to kind of go big picture and, and where things shift when you have some depth concerns at linebacker, or perhaps you don't have that. Uh, ridiculously versatile linebacker and Mo Torre who's going to get the sack numbers up. Well, now the the emphasis kind of shifts to the D-line. I mean, last year they got a lot, good amount of pressures and they did their job, but I think the sack numbers, you know, you would hope for a little bit more. Uh, Aaron and I talked about Wesley Bailey, and I'll get into this later, but, you know, being a little nicked up last year, you know, Lewis, these guys, you want them to step up. And then if, if, if that doesn't happen or if that needs to be diversified a little bit, you have these secondary players who can blitz and you have some exotic packages from Harris Simiak, and then they have to obviously defend the pass if you're not getting the pressure. So I think linebacker is a concern for me just because, you know, some of the depth, although we've heard great things, is not necessarily tested. And then if Powell is is not easing back in or, you know, has a setback or, or one of these other backups who are highly touted has an issue, you know, you're just shifting pressures around the defense. So it starts in that middle, even though we really run with two linebackers, it still starts in that core heart there, and then it shifts around the defense. So I'll be watching how those injuries and depth concerns play into the entire unit. I, I got to say cornerback. Um, I, I kind of teased it on the offensive part before, but – uh, last year, they just ran mostly three cornerbacks between longer beam, between Melton, between Eric Rogers. They lost one of those guys. So either someone has to step up and I know they didn't have Bo Mascow all last season. I know they're very high on him. Al Shadi Salam made the move over from running back to cornerback. Um, speaking of touchdowns in the last pod, he, he actually had one of those rushing touchdowns last year, which is just weird to say when one of your top corners has a rushing touchdown. Um, and then like, there's just a lot of young guys and a lot of guys that haven't gotten many snaps at all. I think that Virginia Tech game could be very opening for some of these guys. Um, like Sage Claw just played some corner last year. Zylan Williams. Um, Trevor Yeboah Cody's not here anymore, and he played in four games. So Kassan Abram's not here anymore. So if, God forbid, something happens in that cornerback room, it gets scary thin pretty quickly. Yeah, um, I'm going to go interior defensive line just because a big part of turning pressures into sacks is just getting an internal push. And we just haven't really had that in a long time. And I think there's a reason why Shiano has two full-time defensive line coaches now, because he realizes how much they need to focus on converting, you know, four-man pressures into sacks or tackles for loss that we weren't really able to, to do last year. I'm going to piggyback off of what a couple other guys have said. I think the safety depth is something that I feel very comfortable with between the top three guys and Shaquan Moyle, Flip Dixon, and Desmond Nick-Venusen. But I think Kosh Sanders has a lot of... Uh, potential as well. I think guys like Sage Claudius is a guy who's been making a lot of noise. I know he's been listed as a corner, but I think he's got the size to play safety and, and the athletic traits to play safety. So I'd say I'm most concerned with the uh, the internal defensive line, and I'm most happy with the safety play. Yeah, I, I think I, I'll go with Aaron or Richie because I think both situations is quite similar. I mean, at corner, behind the starters, Zylan Williams, I believe, played two snaps – uh, Al Shadi Salam nine, Nakun two, but they were at wide receiver, and Masco had 26 only in the bowl game. That's it. And so that does concern me. But then at linebacker, Abram Wright only played 28 snaps all year. Wright Collins 31, and Moses Walker 42. Jabomi 85. So none of those are really numbers that you're going to feel excited and confident in. Um, I, I would say I probably am more concerned at corner just because of i think like richie was saying or you mike like the virginia tech game balls are gonna be flying all over the place and if one of those guys has to play significant snaps you know that might be an eye opener for them <clears throat> but in terms of linebacker that's also it's kind of a cop-out answer but i feel pretty confident in both the linebackers to stop the run as well as internal interior defensive line to stop the run because we, yeah, we haven't seen a pass rush from the inside, but if they had to, like Aaron Lewis could play inside, Jordan Thompson could play some snaps inside. So I, I, I see the point about them not getting an interior pass rush, but they haven't had that anyway. So I guess I'm just not expecting it when it comes to like being quote worried about something going down because, you know, the drop off isn't that big in terms of being able to stuff the run. Sure, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I'm going to kick back to a topic we 
talked about last time. Is there any underrated storyline about the defense that anyone has that wants to expound upon or thinks needs to be covered more before we get into our categories? I wouldn't say it needs to be covered more, but I, I like longer beam a heck of a lot. I know Max. Max was a great corner and, a, and special teams player for us. Legacy, obviously, you know, going to the league. But I think arguably, you know, longer beam, when you saw him, he was defending a pass and you didn't even hear from him a lot of the rest of the time because he was on his guy like glue. I don't know if it's underreported, but I just think, you know, I, I get the cornerbacks as a unit for sure. And, and God forbid something should happen to him. But I think a little bit underrated story is that he might be he might be the best corner, you know, arguably returning. And I think it's uh, an interesting thing to watch. I, I, I think uh, in terms of the, the linebacker concerns now, uh, it puts more pressure on the defensive line to be able to generate pressure on the quarterback on a consistent basis. Chiano has been pretty adamant, you know, all off season about not doing that well enough last year uh, and being a point of emphasis at, to your point, Mike, hiring two assistant coaches to coach the defensive line. Uh, and I think, you know, th that just puts even more onus on them to be able to create uh, consistent pressure in the pass game. Now that you don't have that reliability at the linebacker position, uh, you're going to be you're not wanting to take as many risks per se. So if they can't generate a pass rush and have depth in terms of rotational pieces to be able to, to utilize, uh, I think it's going to be uh, a, definitely a, a, a something that could this defense could struggle with. Yeah, I just I don't think we talk enough about Joe Harris Simiak being retained in, for another year. This is a guy that Greg trusts more than anything. If you go back to Greg Shiano 1.0, he was calling defense what like 80, 90 percent of the time. Um, I think the one year he had a technical DC in name it was Bob Frazier, who we know wasn't a DC. Um, so the fact that he has a guy that he could trust out there to actually call plays on, on every defensive set. Instead of worrying about that, it gives him a lot of other things that he can go kind of fix, whether it be like defensive back unit, defensive line. He can kind of go fo put his focus elsewhere instead of just focusing on the defense. And mind you, Joe Harris Simix, one of the what, one of the best defensive coordinators in the country. Uh, I think you can argue now he's getting uh, nom or head coach interviews, I should say. He's getting defensive coordinator interviews from other schools. Uh, the fact that they were able to re retain him again for what, third year in a row? Um, that's just huge. Yeah, I'll. I'll add to that. First of all, as many of your listeners may or may not know, I grew up with Joe Harrisimiak. My parents, oh, my dad right. actually, my dad that. actually went to high school and graduated the same. Both of his parents too, and so. But for the record, I have not spoken with him since he took the Rutgers job. <laughs> so, just if Coach Shiano's listening out there, there's been no contact. <laughs> and he, I saw his parents yeah. at his Hall of Fame induction ceremony, which he didn't make because he was recruiting. <laughs> so, uh, all that stuff yeah but um i, I think that kind of leads me to the storyline that coach Giano talks about though about what's best for the team versus what's best for the player and i i hinted at this in the in the offensive with with that being less of an issue there but on the defensive side let's say tyreen powell is your best blitzer and you need help for, at that position he's coming back in limited snaps do you just let him come in for Jabomi or Walker? Or do you say, why don't we put you in this more like, uh, you know, chess piece type role or Aaron Lewis? Is this Aaron Lewis have to play inside? That's not necessarily best for him to pile up sacks per se, mm -hmm. or defensively. Does Shaquan Loyal need to be, you know, playing as a cover guy to increase his stock versus blitzing all the time? Like these are some of the things that we haven't had these big people problems at Rutgers for a long time. And now like Harris Simiak and Shiano are going to have to figure out like, do we need to do this for the team or do I have to put this player on the side and say, Hey, like, this is what we need to do. This is what we need from you. I know that one of the great all time NFL scouts, Dave Tay Thomas, the late Dave Tay, Tom Dave Tay Thomas was great at this, at getting this information to scouts about, Hey, this guy was playing out of position or, you know, maybe this guy was hurt. And so, you know, hopefully we can see a, we can see what's best for the team because, but at the same time, like, I, I don't, I'll feel bad for a player who is not highly regarded in their future because they basically just had to take one for the team this year. All great points. And I'm glad I kind of opened this up because those are not things I had on my show sheet for the most part. So appreciate all you guys bringing these uh, interesting side angles to look at the season on defense from let's go to our, our, our season preview uh, topics though. So I'm gonna go first, I'm gonna start it off with the, the leading tackler. Um, 
And I have that over under set at 99 and a half total tackles. Last year, Deion Jennings led the team with 95 total tackles. Larry, I'm going to kick it to you. Who do you see as the leading tackler on this team? Is it over or under that 99 and a half number? I have Flip Dixon, and the reason I have Flip Dixon is because I think the linebacker core is going to be more diversified this year, so those guys aren't going to be getting all the tackles. Flip was up there near the top last year, um, and I think he's going to have to absorb some more of that, maybe step up sometimes, literally, in, in the in the uh, pre-snap design. And, and you know, I think he's going to absorb where some of those leaders would have been a linebacker who was a mainstay you're going to see some diversification in the linebacker core. So I think that gives Flip a chance uh, just by the fact that you're going to have a plurality at linebacker to be the leading tackler. Um, I had him at under. That's almost 100. And, and I think just because he's the leader, given the plurality at the linebacker core, doesn't mean that, you know, the total tackles that, that somebody like him would get is going to skyrocket up to around 100. Uh, like maybe a leading linebacker would be close to with the 95 last year. So I have him under, but I don't think he'll be under by a whole bunch. Uh, you could see him somewhere in the 70s to 80s, probably 70s. I think he had 51 solos last year. Um, yeah, he had 76 total last year. So it's, it's it'll be around, you know, maybe a little more. But I think just because of the plurality, we're going to see a linebacker. He's going to emerge as the leading leading guy, and that's how I have it. I, I wanted to pick linebacker too, but I just – I don't know. Like I can't see Tyreen Powell be leading the team in tackles. I know he had a couple games last year where he hit double digits, mostly in the beginning of the season. Then he tailed off. Also, how much is he really going to play uh, early on in those limited? He's going to get limited snaps to start. We, I'm, I think we can all agree on uh, coming back from not only an ACL but also an Achilles. Um, I want to say Jabome because I think Jabome is going to fill in for him quite a bit, and I think Jabome can kind of play both of those positions. Um, both those linebacker spots, and I, I think he's probably your next linebacker up. And especially with Mo, Mo Touré out, you can kind of fill him in in that void, or just fill him in until Powell's really fully healthy. I'm also going to go with Daryl Jabome, and it's for two main reasons. One, I don't think Tyreen Powell plays the first two games, so those are two games right off the top that you're probably not going to have your top linebacker. Who, if he was fully healthy, I would think most of us would select Tyreen Powell to lead the team in tackles, especially given Mo Touré being out. Second, I think Jabome is going to be given those easy assignments where it's basically like the line is setting you up to just make that tackle to the running back. Um, whereas whether it be Moses Walker or whether it be Tyreen Powell are going to be really more responsible for the coverage aspect of playing linebacker. So I think Daryl Jabome uh, leads the team in tackles in part due to the the, the plurality. And I think he's he's not going to lead the, the linebacking crew in snaps on the season, but I do think he's going to be putting more opportunities to make easy tackles and I don't think it's over the 99 and a half. I think it's under by a significant amount. And I put set these over unders uh, before Oture got hurt. So I probably would set the over under at a lower number having that uh, in mind, but that's where I got it. How about you, David? I, I'm going to go with Larry on this one. I, I see the argument, uh, Mike and Richie with Jabome. I mean, we saw, for example, under the defense with Fadu Kasi, like they basically, this, this, the defense was to funnel the ball to him. And then yep. have him make a tackle. I'm not sure if the Harrisimiac defense is exactly the same as that, but I just think it's Dixon because I think that the linebackers are, even if they improve in coverage, there's going to be growing pains, and he's going to have to just be that second guy a lot. Now, maybe, maybe as a like the, maybe it's a lot of assisted tackles, or you know, he's not immediately the first guy on the scene, but I would see him making a lot of those secondary tackles, even tackles where maybe Loyal or Igben Oson is going for a strip because he know they have help and they're trying to generate turnovers. I just I just think there's going to be a lot more plays in the middle of the field this year, uh, and he's going to be the guy who's just around the ball the most. But I'll take the under because, like you said, I, I think I, I don't think it's a situation where you don't usually want your safety leading the team in tackles because that probably means your far, first two <laughs> levels are not doing their job. But I, I just – he has a nose for the ball and he has a sense of where plays are going. And that's why I just feel like he's just going to be there a lot. Even if like Larry was saying that the number of solo tackles, you know, may not be that much higher than what do you tell you at 51 last year, but just total, I think he's going to be the leader. Uh, but I do, I would say under. I'm going to take the under two uh, and I'm going to be a little bit different, uh, but also because I believe it's possible uh, and again, to be clear, I don't think this player is at the level of Motoray, but I think in terms of athletic ability, skill set, 
the player most similar to Ture is Moses Walker. And I think just his ability to go sideline to sideline, I think he has a real shot to be the leading tackler. I think it will be the under, uh, but uh, for the sake of variety, but also because I really do think he has a very high ceiling and that he's a player that could ultimately lead this team in tackling. Let's do our sack leader next. So I have the over under for sack leader at six and a half sacks. Um, Rich, who do you have as your player leading the team in sacks? And do you see it as over or under that six and a half sack number? I feel like you could easily, you used to be able to easily just put in Mo two right there, right there. And it's like, <laughs> all right, we're done. No, there we go. Um, yeah. not, not anymore. I feel like we, I feel like Aaron Lewis is finally going to break out. I know we've talked about him over and over, and over again, and I know he's not getting the sack numbers, but he's getting the QB pressures, getting a couple QB hits. Uh, he was putting up good numbers in that aspect, but wasn't able to convert those into sacks. And Greg Shiano off all season long has been talking about how they need more pressures from a four man rush. I think this is the year Aaron Lewis finally comes through um, six and a, what was it? Six and a half. You said, yep. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, six, six and a half. I, it's going to be close. I don't think he'll get that. I'm probably going to go under. I'll probably say five. And I think that's a pretty good productive year for Aaron Lewis. Um, and it will also help his draft stock and can go back to the whole, the me versus team argument there. Uh, but I think this is the year Aaron Lewis finally puts it all together, senior year, all cards on the table, and figures it out and gets those sacks. I'm going to go with the defensive end, but on the opposite side, Wesley Bailey. I think, like a few of you guys have mentioned, he was playing beat up last year, and it really showed when you would just kind of watch him early on in the season, just kind of blow past tackles. And obviously, they're playing worse opponents early on. Um, but late in the season, he was just kind of didn't seem to have that same wiggle and burst from the, from the edge that he had early on. But I think this theory puts it together. I think he goes over six and a half. I think it's barely over. I could see him having like a seven sack season, but my guess is Wesley Bailey. Tough one. I, I would say I think both Bailey and Lewis are probably going to be around six. I, I don't see a linebacker having that many. So I'll take the under, but if I had to put money on it, I guess I would say Lewis. But I, I, I think both him and Bailey will be around six which would be double what Lewis only had three last year. So it will be double for him. Yeah, I'm going to go Bailey. I think just his burst, uh, his his speed, uh, his ability to get off the edge when he is healthy. I think, you know, looking back pre pri to prior years, uh, th he showed that in flashes. And I think all the senior class is really motivated. I think Aaron Lewis is probably taking things really personally in terms of how Shiano has challenged this defensive line, which is a good thing for this defense. Uh, so I agree. I think they're the best two options, but I think Bailey, just in terms of his pure speed and ability to get off that edge, I, I'm going with Bailey. But I, I will go under as well. Since Bailey's, you know, been on this team, you've seen this burst. And I remember when we were first just hearing kind of rumblings about how high the staff was on Bailey all the way to seeing it come to fruition in the games. Uh, I sit close to the Rutgers sideline every game, and I can tell you, like, there's so many times where Bailey comes off for a play or two or off after a drive, and he seems to be limping along or a little bit hurt. And I think he was nicked up, yet he still managed four sacks. I think Ture, what did he have, 4.5 based on the stat sheet I'm looking at. So it's not like he was so far behind him. I think you're going to need the the line and the ed, the guys on the edges to step up. I think Bailey's just that natural pass rusher who has that electric, you know, push to get to the quarterback. I think if he's healthy and he can stay healthy and maybe the staff emphasizes that in some way, I think Bailey's going to going to get his sacks. I have him I have him over. Um it's close, uh but I think if he can really Put the pedal to the metal and also if the line's worried about lewis because you guys are predicting him too and i think he is taking it personally and now they've got to decide what's the strong side and you know who we honing in on you're going to have uh even more opportunity for him to get in there so i'm giving him the over uh and i think uh, i don't know if it'll be too far over but i think a good season you know was seven to to nine sacks in it which is gonna be crazy but you hope he has a monster year if he can come back healthy so does anyone feel brave enough to throw a dark horse out there for a guy that you think legitimately could lead the team in sacks, but obviously the Wesley Bailey and Aaron Lewis are the, the, the heavy co-favorites. Is there any third guy you guys feel strongly about having a good season rushing the passer? I'll, I'll throw my dark horse as Moses Walker. And Ooh, interesting. But, but this isn't, this is not a total positive. I think, I don't think he's going to be as <laughs> developed in coverage as we think. And so the logical thing to do would be just let him come on some delayed blitzes or just send him like, and, and 
just roll the dice because I think one of the things that made Chiano as well as Sarah Simiak successful as defensive coaches is they know when they need to bring that extra guy and when they need to force the offense to make a play. And so one of the ways to do that, I mean, much like we talk about Manungai, that they can't see him through the line. Like if your defensive tackles are occupying guys, like they're, Moses Walker's not that tall. It may be hard for guys to see him just like with Toure. Like he, obviously he's like 6'2". He looks like a huge guy. But when your mm-hmm. defensive tackles are huge, sometimes you can just sneak that linebacker up the middle and – can he beat a back and get to the QB? I mean, I, I think it may be more of a testament to them not thinking their front four can get pressure than anything else, but I, there's entirely a possible scenario where it's Moses Walker. I like that. I would say if it was – if we're being bullish on the sack total and, you know, we're getting up these these linemen up around six, seven, I think it's going to be hard to have the dark horse I'm going to mention. But if we're down around, you know, three or four to lead the team, I think somebody in that secondary group, somebody in the safety group, because of blitz, mm-hmm. you, you get a guy like Dixon or Loyal sometimes coming off the edge or, you know, blitzes. If, if we're down all around – three or four sacks to lead the team you might have to to dave's point you might have blitzing player uh leading the team i don't think so but but it could happen that would be my really unexpected dark horse all right let's go on to the interception leader for the team this year uh I have the over under set at three and a half i think last year we were led by max melton who had three i'm gonna say the obvious choice I think a lot of people probably would have is their 1A and Robert Longerbeam. Um, if he's playing anything like he does for me in NCAA uh, football, uh, well, CFB 25, he should go way over this three and a half number. But I'm going to say he gets the four or five picks. Um, he's got really great ball skills, and I think he converts more of those uh, deflected passes into interceptions this year. So I'm going to say he gets four or five picks. Going over to me? Yep. I'm going to take, for that exact reason, I'm going to take Rodgers because I do think teams are going to really test him a lot, even early in the season, middle of the season, because Robert Longerbeam has a proven rack pre- uh, track record. He's got a lot of passes defended to your point, even if they're not picks and they're going to go at Rodgers. I mean, maybe even go. And that's whether Rodgers is playing in the slot or he's playing on the outside. I mean, obviously we think he's going to play on the outside, but when they do have a nickel corner, he's, he's done a good job both, spots and it's probably easier to put a new guy in further away from the ball so um i I just think rogers is going to be in the middle of a lot of plays yeah i'll mix it up i'm going to go with shaquan loyal i think that he could be utilized a little bit differently and uh, could be used in coverage as well not just uh, as a safety but uh moved up to cornerback here and there and i think just he's shown flashes as a ball hawk in the past obviously he's got big playmaking ability after he gets the interceptions so I think he's going to lead them. I think this is the year he steps up and, and breaks out. I think he'll get four, so I'm going to go the over. And I think he's going to run. Uh, I, I'm going to say, I know I'm skipping ahead, but I was going to say he's going to run one back as well. But I'm going to go Shaquan <laughs> Lawyer. Yeah, I, I, I thought I was going to be the original one again, but I was not because Aaron uh, swiped it right out like a draft pick that I was waiting on. Uh, Shaquan Loyal, I just <laughs> – I don't pretend to be, you know, the the most well-versed X's and O's guy. So I'm not positive, you know, how they mix up coverages and things like that. What I do know is, you know, I think Longer Beam is an excellent corner. I think he's – and, you know, he defends quite well, and they might not throw at him very much. If you look at last season's stats, you had Max at three, and then you kind of had one, 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 one down the line. To echo Aaron, you know, I like Shaquan as a ball hawk. You know, we all remember that Temple game. You don't know how, even if somebody else is defending the pass and they're looking at him, the eyes focus in on the corner, a safety like that, especially when you got three roaming around a lot of times, three corners, all of a sudden can can pop up and snatch that ball when you're not even looking. Um, I also think he might want run one back. I don't know what it is. Maybe just that Temple game, positive, warm, fuzzy memories. I got him at the under, though. I mean, I don't – none of them, even Max last year, had three. No one was clearing four. I would love for that to happen. But now you're also talking about Loyal, who hasn't – pushed it that far above, uh, you know, the low single digits very frequently in his career. I think other guys are going to get picks too. Um, I think it'd be three, uh, but I think that for that reason, I'm taking the under. I'm going to follow Dave here, and I'm going to say it's going to be Eric Rogers. Uh, if you look at the numbers last year, according to PFF, they targeted longer beam 77 times last season. Max Mountain was next, uh, next highest at 44. So they're probably going to go after that cornerback too for the most part. 
try to attack him as much as possible. And I think Eric Rodgers is a damn good corner in his own right. I don't think he gets enough credit. Now, obviously, he didn't play as many snaps as you would think last year because you did have Max Melton out there in longer beam all season. But I think this year, I think he steps up. I think he assumes that cornerback two role, and I think they're going to target him a bunch, and it's just going to result in a couple picks here and there. Uh, that number is really tricky for three and a half. I'm going to say over just because he's going to be targeted so much, but I can very easily see it being under. Um, I'm going to go over some special team stuff now. Longest field goal made last year by Jay Patel was 51 yards. So I set the over under at 51 and a half this year. Um, what do you think the longest field goal of the season is for, on the season? Is it over 51 and a half or under 51 and a half, David? Over. Uh, the way the reason I say that is he hit a 51 yarder last year. You have an unproven punter, and that basically means you're what? You're at the 35 yard line. Yeah. And you're going to trust your punter to pin him at like the three, an inexperienced guy wasn't even here in spring practice, or do you go for that 52, 53 yarder? I think you go for the kick uh, in good weather. Obviously there's their factors, but mm -hmm. I, I think they're going to hit one over. Yeah, I agree. I think Shiano trusts Patel. I think he's, uh, you know, he, he showed how accurate he was last year. He's got a big leg. Uh, he was pretty good from deep. I think he'll definitely go over. Uh, I think he's going to hit more than one over 51.5 this Ooh. year. That is, you're getting spicier now. All right, Larry, <laughs> they set the stage for you to get even more spicy. Quite spicy, man, and I like spicy food, but I can't go that spicy, Aaron. I, I think he's going to go over, though. I mean, I, I think he's going to hit a 52-yarder, a 53-yarder at least once. Um, you know, he was it was his first year consistently being the kicker last year, and I loved what I saw from him. He's confident. I like his leg. I like his accuracy. I think when you're when you're young and you're you know dealing with the pressure and things coming in, you know I wasn't surprised he missed a few. But I was always I was always kind of confident when I was like kick the ball and let him kick it. Yeah. I, I like him. I, I think yeah. you know he might miss a few, and everybody does over fifty yards. Everybody misses a few over fifty one, but he can hit a few. And I'm bullish on him, and I'm bullish on him going forward, getting more and more consistent with long field goals. I think he definitely nails one this year. I'm going to say under, uh, or he's not going to nail one uh, from that long. I don't think he has the leg for it, and I wouldn't be shocked if, God forbid, it was a super long field goal in dire need that they go to someone like Jack Scullion. Um, They need someone with more power. Jay Patel doesn't have as much power as you'd like in a kicker, but we know he's very accurate, and that's obviously the biggest key when it comes to kicking, uh, field goal kicking at least. Um, so I, I'm going to say under, and I and if, if they do hit it over, I don't think it's going to be Jay Patel. I think it's going to be Scullion, if I'm pronouncing that right. Uh, I'm also going to go over. Um, it is kind of interesting, just the the odyssey we've gone on with kickers where, you know, remember in Shiano's first or second year, we weren't even attempting 45-yard field goals. Like, mm -hmm. you know, we were going for it on fourth and six from, you know, the 30-yard line because we didn't trust the kicker to even line up at that distance. You know, think no further than the the Michigan game, the, the biggest exactly. swinging door in the Big Ten recent history yeah. where, you know, we win that game. Harbaugh's probably fired. The entire course of, you know, Big Ten history is, is altered, but he missed mm -hmm. that field goal. Uh, he goes on to have, you know, a nice little second act in his career at Tulane. But, uh, no, I think I think they feel confident in lining up Jay Patel from long distance. I have a spicy take. I think he has a walk-off kick this year where as the, the ball goes through the uprights, we win a game. I don't know which game it's going to be, but I think Jay Patel's foot leads us to a walk-off at least once this year. Mm -hmm. Um Sticking with special teams, let's talk punt and kick blocks. I have the over-under set at one and a half blocks on this season. It's a Shiano specialty. I think we'll probably have similar answers to this. But, Aaron, where do you got the over-under at? Yeah, definitely over there. I think they could more than double that one and a half. I think uh, you're getting more athletic. Uh, you're going to have a lot of younger guys on special teams looking to prove themselves uh we know in the punt game you know rutgers goes for the block pretty much on every opportunity so i think they'll definitely go over by a pretty wide margin there over over i mean if we're not blocking kicks and and we're not uh you know causing havoc and and shifting momentum in that game a lot of these toss-up games aren't going to necessarily go the way we want them to and you're going to have some maybe, you know, early in the season, some blowouts or even some games we're dominating where teams are on their heels and we feel the momentum and rush in and block them too. We're back in that respect under Shiano. It pretty much set the stage and won us the Michigan State game last year. And, you know, funny story. We were, I, look, I'm a diehard fan. I sat there through that cold rain all the way to like halfway or 
early in the fourth quarter. My girlfriend was there. She's shivering. I took Dean, are you nuts on the board? I'm like, we got to go. We're, we're heading back <laughs> up to Jersey City, and, and we're both in the car, and Shiano decides to make them re-kick. And we're already mm. mad. We're like, why is he making him re-kick? Oh, please. What, we, what does he think? He's going to block the kick. And sure enough, blocks the kick. We have an epic ride home. I'm one hand on the you know wheel, one hand dapping him up because we're winning the game. Don't count him out. Don't count the punt blocks out. Over. I love it. It's fun. I still remember the uh, Kamoko Ture swat down against Michigan. I oh, yeah. Great game. Yeah, we're going to go over. Let's do it. Change the order. I can't follow this guy up. <laughs> <laughs> I can't do it anymore. I'm, like, I'm this close to like punching a computer screen just because I'm so high. <laughs> um, over, over in punt slash kick blocks. Rutgers is a punt block team, not a punt return team, not a kick return team. We've heard Shiano say it time and time again. They're not going to go for the return. They're probably just going to catch it, fair catch it, whatever. Um, so they're going to sell out for the block, and I don't blame them because it's been very successful under his tenure. I think there's – if I forget what the exact stat is, it's like dating back to whenever Rutgers leads the NCAA in block kicks or block punts. Uh, and I don't see it changing anytime soon. If it works – if it ain't broke, don't fix it. All right. Uh, I'm going to say over as well, uh, comfortably. I think they can get to three or four, especially against some of the the teams like Akron and Howard. Like, don't be surprised if, you know, the first punt attempt on uh, Thursday night is a block punt. Like, they're just going to overwhelm them from a physical standpoint. And I don't think Shiano's going to throw his trickiest looks uh, in special teams out game one. He's always – that's, like, the one of the, the things that I feel like he – it's tough because it's, like, a pure, like, football guy thing, but to see, like – how they bring different pressures on punt blocks every week and how they're, how successful they are, even when they don't block punts, but changing the the direction of kicks because they have to either like take an extra step to the left or the right, or just kind of knowing the, the, uh, the reputation they have just kind of brings fear into every special team unit in the big 10 and beyond. Um, mm-hmm. But I think it goes over, but sticking with that rough trend, uh, I have the over under for special teams and defensive touchdowns at two and a half. Uh, Aaron, where do you, th- or is it Aaron or is it Larry? Sorry, Larry, Larry let's see. Where are we at? Over or under two and a half? I'm going over only because you, you know, if you got special, t- it's, it's every kind of touchdown, right? So if you have a couple yeah. block yeah. kicks, three, one of those at least, maybe two, at least one might go for a touchdown and then you could have a return. I know what, what gives me pause is I don't know that our kick return game is so electric these days, right? I, I, if it's Dremel back there again, consistent, you know, reliable. Um, but is it electric enough to kind of get us to the promised land? That gives me pause. But if but if I'm assuming, and I am, that we're going to get at least one from uh, a, a block, and it's only a, a two point five, we just need two more. Um, and, and you have defensive TD. So what am I talking about? Yeah, over. What am I? Well, I think we're going to a pick six. So like. Yeah, never mind my whole diatribe of nonsense. Over, and I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Again, dude, switch the lineup. I can't do this. <laughs> um, I'm going to go under. Um, they just, the special teams, I just said it before, they're a punt block, kick block team. They're not going to go for the return. So you could probably just take that one away right, right then and there. Um, defensive touchdowns is where it gets a little finicky like they do play Akron who stinks a new quarterback they do play Howard who who's actually a decent Howard team compared to uh most of the Howard teams they faced over the years but uh they're still not a uh, big 10 level good um there's some other not cupcakes but easier games on the schedule uh, a lot of new quarterbacks that they're going to face this year too so I'm going to say under but uh, again this is one that could really go either way I got the over. I think this defense is going to be better than last year. I think the special teams are always reliable, or reliable to get one or two throughout the season. I can see them having a few pick sixes, a fumble recovery for a touchdown, two block punts recovered for, for a touchdown. I think this is comfortably over. I'll take the over because of uh, the reasons everybody said. On one hand, I think schedule-wise, and we'll get to more of that in the next episode, but you usually get these on special teams when you play teams that haven't faced you. And there's a lot of teams that have not faced Rutgers recently that's that, now that we're changing the divisions. So, like, Miami was not ready. They were not ready, right? <laughs> and so I think that there's an advantage there. And then the other thing, defensively, how many near pick sixes were dropped by the longer beams, the Dixons, even maybe Igmanosin once or twice last year? I mean, you just got to convert, like, one or two of those, and it's a comfortable over. Absolutely. Yep. 
Let's uh let's transition to breakout player on defense. Uh, same thing as the offense. Kind of use your own criteria for defining a breakout. But Rich, who's your breakout player on defense? Uh, I kind of mentioned it before. I think it's going to be Jabome. I think he's going to step up. Um, he's going to fill that linebacker role. I think until Powell's 110% healthy, he'll probably fill in as the starter, but that's still to be determined. Um, but I think even when Powell uh, comes back full time, I think they just shift him over next to Powell. I think he's going to play a ton of snaps this year. Um, he's shown flashes in, in practices and in games. Uh, he didn't play a ton last year, but it's mostly specials. But the staff is extremely high on him. They think that he's going to be the next great Rutgers linebacker that they have. Um, and it's just going to be kind of a pipeline in that linebacker room going forward. But I think he'll be the, uh, the name to keep an eye on and a name you'll probably hear a lot this year. I'm going to go with Bo Mascal for mine. I think he's going to be a guy who has a pick six at some point this season with an acrobatic catch. He's got really good size for a corner. He fits perfectly into what Shiano looks for from a speed, size, length perspective at the cornerback position. And I think he's just a name that because he had some academic, uh, not even, not there were non-issues. It was just NCAA compliance crap that kept him out of last year. He would have been playing a lot last year had that not cropped up. You saw him in the bowl game, make some plays. I think he's going to be the breakout player on defense. Yeah, I agree with you, Mike, that I think cornerback three is probably the most likely for this, which is hopefully him, hopefully uh, Bo Masco. But I, I think if you watch the media, I think Kyle Sanders has a good chance. I mean, it doesn't look like there's a place for him to play, but I mean, I mean, he's making smoothies for kids in Newark with Juan <laughs> Loyal. So clearly th there seems to be with him and Ian Strong on offense, this concerted effort to kind of push them as, you know, future faces of this team moving forward. And so there's a scenario where Sanders just kind of forces his way on the field. I, I'm not sure how. Yeah, I would say him or, you know, obviously the guy I hope, I'll give you a dark horse, I hope it is DJ Allen because they really need another edge that, that can make plays. And with Conga gone, which was a bigger loss than I think we're giving him credit for, I mean, they need somebody who brings a little bit of that juice off the bench that can give you a, a, a spark. So I hope it's DJ Allen, but I, I would say it's probably Masco or yeah, Sanders. I'm going to switch it up with someone we haven't talked about at all that uh, was a solid contributor for really, really good defense last year. That's Malcolm Ray from Florida State. I think what he can provide inside in the run game, uh, I think he could be considered a breakout player just because I think he's going to hit the ground running and elevate the play of the defensive line in the run game. Uh, just with the experience he has, his size, uh, and uh, so I'm looking at him. Uh, Jabome, I got to go with. You, you got the injury now to Ture. I agree with Richie. The staff seems high on him based on all reports you've seen. If you even looked at when you guys are going through the snap counts for some of the you know depth linebackers last year, it looked like he had the most. Obviously, they were already trying to work him in. Uh, the Canada standout kind of guy they were high on, I think, from day one who could really take those strides, be that electric player. Uh, he could be that guy, like I said, in that pipeline. Who's the, and Richie said that that long line of linebackers they're planning on here. I'm looking for him to be the breakout player. I think he's the type of guy that by the end of the year, all of a sudden you're talking about him with all this fanfare where we were so worried uh, with the injury. And not that Torrey is not a huge loss, but if Jabome can step up and make a name for himself, it bodes well for the team. And I think if he can really get in there and be versatile, uh, everybody will know his name by the end of the year. Love it. All the great answers. Um, let's move to defensive MVP. Um, I have a guy who has been mentioned a good amount in here and who took over three or four games last year in a row where it was just like, this guy is literally the entire third quarter. That's Flip Dixon. I think he prolongs those stretches of dominance throughout most of the season. And given the issues we're going to have at linebacker, we're going to need safety play to step up. I think it's the deepest unit on the defense. And I think Flip Dixon is primed to just have a huge season. So my answer is Flip Dixon. I'll go with Robert Longerbeam because I think if you can have a true shutdown corner, then you're basically playing 10 on 10 in a smaller area of the field. I Maybe it's a little bit optimistic, but I kind of think they need him to be that. But I think it's him. I agree with Mike on Dixon. I think simply because also he's going to be asked to do more this year, uh, having what, you know, the prototype of what he did last year with the holes they have a linebacker. I think they're going to trust him more. Harris Simiak and him have a great relationship. So I see Dixon doing more and more and uh, him being the MVP. 
Flip Dixon, I'm going to echo the sentiments of you guys. Look, he has, somebody said earlier, he has a nose for the ball. He's always where the action is. And whether that's going to be causing a fumble, recovering a fumble, just leading the team in tackles like I predicted, um, picking the ball off, you know, making game-changing plays. He's he's a leader on this team. Uh, he's by far an upperclassman. And and I think, like to echo some other sentiments, with some of those problems in the, in the linebacking core, these safeties we have can hit. They're kind of these hybrid players, which is why we only run with two linebackers a lot, part of the reason. Uh, so I expect him to have a big year, and and he would be my MVP prediction. I really wanted to say longer beam, but I, I think I'm actually going to go with Tyreen Powell. If he can prove that he's fully healthy. Now, obviously, these first two games are meh. Who cares? Just, just get out there, shake off the rust a little bit, and that's it. Get out of the game. Stay healthy. Need you for Virginia Tech, et cetera. Um, but I think as long as he's fully healthy and proved he's fully healthy by week four, I think there's no reason why he shouldn't be the team MVP. I think we were talking about him as team MVP last year before the injury. So yeah. I think he has a good shot of doing that as long as he's it's, – it's all on health. It's all really dependent on his health. And if he, he can get there and uh, be 100%, I think that there's no reason why he shouldn't be MVP. The final topic I have here is team total defense rank. Similar to offense, the under is better, the over is worse. Last year, Rutgers finished as the number 16 overall defense in total yardage at 313.5 yards per game. Uh, the 25th ranked team was at 326.1. David, do you think we finish at over or under that overall rank this year? I think Rutgers gives up a lot more yards. So I would take the over, I guess, not as well. I just think that there's going to be more teams, even if they're empty calorie yards, that are just going to be throwing throwing, throwing, you know, third and 10, they throw for eight. It's not like Iowa where third and 10, they run for two. I mean, I think sure. that there's a lot of empty calorie yardage that we're going to see this year. And just that in tandem with the fact that we're just going to see more passing attacks. Last year we faced one team, one, that was primarily a passing team that threw, I think, more than 55%, and that was Maryland. Everybody else threw under. So I, I just – I have a hard time seeing – I can see Rutgers being a top 25 team overall, but not having a top 25, you know, defensive yardage ranking. Yeah, I agree. I see him more in the 30, that 30 to 40 range. I think there's just more question marks on this defense. Obviously, you're losing Max Melton. I, I think there's reasons to believe in Eric Rodgers. Uh, but in terms of the linebacker core, the defensive line, you know, how consistent can they be with the, uh, with the pass rush? Uh, I just think there's more questions on this defense. I don't think it should be assumed they're just going to be just as good or better this year uh, until they prove that they can be. So I'm going to say they're going to actually be worse in terms of a yardage perspective. Uh, both compelling, you know, points and arguments based on the schedule and based on, you know, what we're going to see in terms of giving up more yardage. But I, we were 16 last year. You believe in the coaching staff. You believe in, in Harris Simiak. A lot of guys are returning who were key players. We lose to Ray, you know, but we have some other prospective players that could step up. We we keep a lot of our, you know, we lose some some key guys. We keep a lot of the guys that are that are on that defense that are core players that kept guys low last time. I just find it hard to believe, even if we were to fall back to 20, 21, you know, that we're going to go all the way from 16 to over, you know, essentially 25. Not that it would be. Uh, unprecedented not that it's you know impossible given the points that were made but it's just kind of a gut feeling when you're returning that many guys you're returning that staff and you have a reputation to uphold um more of passing teams are going up against in the schedule but perhaps teams that we could take on a little bit better uh so i, I believe that they'll they'll keep it under uh being 25th you're muted rich you're muted yeah, I knew that. I was just testing you guys. Um, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, I think it's going to be like top 30-ish. I do think there's going to be a little bit of a fallout. I think Max Melton was uh, superior, uh, severely underrated by the, the coaching – or not the coaching staff, by the fans. Um, the injury definitely played a factor last year, and he was still able to be a pretty damn good corner. I don't know if Eric Rodgers is able to replace that. I, don't, I know Longer Beam is pretty damn good in his own right. Um, so I do think, like Dave said, they're going to pass a lot more. Uh, losing two Ray definitely hurts. It hurts a lot. Um, they're, like I said before, they're not going to be able to replace him fully, but they'll have guys that can at least step up and fill the void a little bit. Um, it's really going to be dependent, I feel like, on that pass rush. If they can develop a pass rush, then their defense should still be pretty damn good. If they can't, then that's where it's going to take a really big dip. 
Um, it's going to be interesting. I, I really don't know what to think of this defense, but like I said before, Joe Harris, Simeon, year three. Um, I think he's pretty good with uh, in-game adjustments too, and that's a big factor, but I'm going to probably say top 30-ish overall. I'm going to kind of agree with everything that was said regarding the over. I think you're going to be, you're going to see a team and we'll get to this, I guess I'm teasing a bit of what I think is going to go down with the schedule, but <laughs> I think we're going to be playing from in front a lot more this season, which is going to naturally force teams to pass. And you're going to complete more, like David said, uh, empty calorie pe- uh, yardage mm-hmm. passes uh, on the defense that you did last year. A lot more teams that are pass first oriented you know, we didn't play with, we played Wisconsin last year, sorry, but we played USC this year. We play uh, UCLA. We play all those Pac-10 teams, all those Pac-12 teams that are past first or former Pac-12 teams. Mm-hmm. Um, I think you're just going to, the confluence between playing teams that like to pass more and playing from ahead more, you're just going to see more yards given up. doesn't mean they're not a better unit. If you're just talking about talent v. talent, I think this year's team is probably, now that Ture is out about even with last year, but if, T- if Ture wasn't uh, hurt, I would say it's a, a much better team than last year defensively overall. But uh, just because, you know, we might be equal to or maybe even slightly better than last year doesn't mean the statistics are going to remain steady. So I'm going to say they also go over that number, but I don't think they fall out of the top 40 defenses in terms of yardage. I think they're still going to be a very good defense. But um, In terms of final thoughts, does anyone have anything we didn't talk about defensively they think is worth bringing up or just final thoughts overall on the defense this year? I have, I have two. Uh, let me first start with a question. Sure. Rutgers has had a big pipeline of defensive tackle transfers come in year after year, the Dwum Fours, Mija, mm-hmm. and Aiton last year. Aiton actually, because if you guys have the PFF grades, he scored much better than I thought he, he did when I was looking back at that. So the question is, better is will Malcolm Ray be better than Isaiah Aiton this season? So Isaiah Aiton – he was just like such a massive human being. He was like such a great space eater in the middle of the defense. I think he won't be as, I don't think Ray will be as good of a run defender, but I think he'll be a better pass rusher than Isaiah. And I know that's a bit of a cop out, um, but I think we will see more sacks out of Malcolm Ray than we did out of Isaiah. Can Richie, can you even talk about oh, this? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I think, no, no, I, I can talk about it. Um, I think he's he's gonna like like Mike said. He he's more of a pass rusher than Aiton was, whereas Aiton just was just legitimate space. Like it's kind of insane. Um, but uh, it's I don't know what I can and cannot say either. That's a, <laughs> that is a problem. But uh, yeah, no, I think I I think Malcolm Ray will be better than Aiton. Just put it like that. Okay. Well, there's my answer because you know Richie said it. <laughs> <laughs> He's at practice. I mean, and I mean that legitimately. Like, what am I going to say? Well, I like some pie in the sky. Hey, thing. It's like, tough. I mean, like, let's, let's be honest. They're really going to listen to like minute 57 of this podcast. <laughs> oh, yeah. like, let's see. Let's be well, on. <laughs> well, if you, if you take away the, the technical aspect of it, you just look at it from the face of it. Uh, he was a, a rotational piece on mm-hmm. one of the best defenses in the country. I, yeah. you know, came from a mixed bag at Ole Miss where he didn't play as much. So mm-hmm. I, I think Ray will be, have a bigger impact. And then the last one I want to bring up, my, uh, Mike, is I'll tell a quick Harris Simiak story. So <clears throat> when we were in high school, we were the co-captains of the basketball team our senior year. And so last game of the season, we're playing on the road, or last or way game of the season, we're playing against Elmwood Park, hometown of the legendary Mike Dare, Gary Nova, the Datikas. All right. So first half, late in the first half, fast break i take the ball throw a behind the back pass right to harris Simiak, and like by the way he's averaging like 25 a game blows the layup finishes the first half zero points we go into the locker room coach does like does anybody have anything to say he just looks at harris Simiak, doesn't say anything coach walks out nobody says anything we go back out there second half harris Simiak scores like 27 points or whatever <laughs> and we win the game so I thought of that story because on the Ream and Beam podcast, they were making fun of, you know, Aaron Lewis's stats and like Ethan Kelly McManus's high school stats. But I can tell you, Coach Harris Simiak was first team all county in baseball when he led the county in home runs. And he was first team in basketball when he averaged over 20 a game, never mind football, where, you know, obviously his best sport. So uh, the reason I bring that story up is because one of the things that happened to this team last year in that Maryland game is they just seemed shell shocked. And it seemed like they, they didn't. They weren't prepared for the resiliency that they needed to give up some big plays. And I just feel like this coaching staff has the ability 
to pass like this experience and this mindset onto these players that, Hey, you got to have a short memory. We got to move on. And so I think that we didn't get to see that a lot last year in the past games. They didn't face a lot of passing offenses, but that is going to be a key X factor on this defense and their ability to regroup after a big play or a long drive or, you know, a big turnover. And I, I think this defense has it, but uh, you know, to me, that's a huge X factor. I think, you know, that you make a great point with the resiliency. I think some of it depends too on the offensive output, right? Like if you have confidence in your offense and your offense, you have confidence that they can put up a big play or march down the field, you know, even if the run game isn't working as well as you'd like, you can make that clutch pass. You can get that clutch drive. I think that helps too. Like the resiliency of, hey, we can recover. We're still a good defense. Big plays get given up, but also, hey, they have our back. We can play complimentary football and that instills some confidence. I think you see a lot of times is death spiral in football where if your offense isn't making the right plays or coming through on key drives and you're not going tit for tat that way and you give up a big play, you start to get gassed, you start to lose confidence. I'm not saying that happened because I'm not inside the locker room, obviously, but you know when, when they start piling it on and you don't think your guy could keep up, I think it's demoralizing for a defense. So definitely agree with you and interesting points about the coach too. And I would just add that you, you'd hope that the offense instills some confidence in that way as well. Yeah, I think the residual effect of the offense just being if they could be average and competent, uh, what that can do, we've seen so many years, time after time, the defense, but by the time they get to the fourth quarter or, or by the time they get to November, you know, they're out of gas. So I think if the offense can uh, be able to make some plays and, and to be able to keep the ball uh, in possession uh, late in the game uh, in the way they, they were at times last year, but with a more pa uh, competent passing game this year, that will do wonders for – we talked about Manungai benefiting from staying fresher throughout the year. I think you can see that with the defense as a whole as well. All great points, and we want to thank everybody who's made it through part two. I know we've gone long on each, but I hope we're providing some uh, kind of perspectives that you might not have necessarily had your, on your own and giving you some information about this team leading into the season. Now let's take all that information we just aggregated together – and let's use it towards predictions. Stay tuned to part three of this podcast to see what we all think is going to happen game by game this season for Rutgers football. See you then.